Welcome to Atmos 5000, Day 23. We're pulling today from uh, Chapter 14 of the Stoltec book, Sections 14.3, 14.4, and 14.5. We're going to focus in on the tools that we can use to diagnose the boundary layer moisture and what that, how much of that moisture is available for convection. We will look at actually quantifying now the convective available potential energy. We've looked at it qualitatively, but now we're going to figure out how to actually do the calculations. And we'll use the CAPE in order to estimate the updraft velocities inside these uh, large cumulus clouds. We'll actually quantify wind shear. We've talked about it qualitatively, but now we're going to quantify it. And then we'll introduce a new type of uh, diagram called a hodograph, which can actually allow you to uh, visually uh, see the wind shear in the atmosphere. So recall that thunderstorm formation requires lift, instability, and moisture. So what we're looking at here are moisture variables that we can use to diagnose the moisture component of limb. So the good predictors of moisture in the lower part of the atmosphere are dew point temperature, the mixing ratio, the wet bulb temperature, the wet bulb potential temperature, and the equivalent potential temperature. Uh, all of those are good predictors of moisture because they all depend directly upon the amount of water vapor that's in the atmosphere. Poor predictors uh, that you would not want to use to diagnose low level moisture for thunderstorm development would be relative humidity, <clears throat> the saturation mixing ratio, the saturation vapor pressure, and the precipitable water, DW. So relative humidity is a poor predictor because all it tells you is how close you are to saturation. Um, and you could be close to saturation at a low temperature and not have a lot of water vapor available. Um, likewise, the saturation mixing ratio and the saturation water vapor pressure don't tell you how much water vapor you actually have in the atmosphere. They just uh, define how much you possibly could have in the atmosphere, and those two both depend upon temperature. And precipitable water, <clears throat> you would think, would be a really good predictor, but precipitable water is an integrated variable over the uh, depth of the troposphere. And so it's possible that you could have a high precipitable water uh, and still have low moisture in the boundary layer if you happen to have elevated moist layers. Uh, and that would not be good for thunderstorm formation because we really need to have lift of moisture from uh, lower altitudes. So here's an example of moisture advection from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so this is the GFS model results uh, from November 29th of 2018. Uh, and you can superimposed on this are the uh, sea level pressures in hectopascals. Those are the contours. And we also have the winds uh, at uh, 10 meters in knots. And the contour, color contours, are the dew point temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. And the scale is on the right for that. And so what you can see here is that the highest dew points are over the Gulf of Mexico, which is still fairly warm at this time of the year, but cooling off. And the winds are from the south, which are bringing that moisture from the Gulf of Mexico up into uh, the southeastern United States. So we've already got to dew points of 68, which is 20 degrees C, uh, in southern Texas, and that uh, moisture is only going to uh, push further up into the Midwest uh, as those winds continue around this low pressure zone that is situated out uh, at the uh, kind of the boundary of Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And then also off the coast of Florida, you have a high pressure zone. <clears throat> we often refer to that as the Bermuda High. And with this low uh, situated over Colorado and this high situated over uh, the Atlantic near Bermuda, you have this funnel effect of bringing that moisture up from the Gulf of Mexico up into the Midwestern uh, United States. So when we talk about uh, having ample moisture available for convection, uh, 
Um, there's really no magic number, but uh, you can basically say that if you have dew point temperatures greater than 20 degrees C, which would be greater than 68 degrees Fahrenheit, that that is fairly moist. Uh, you can do a calculation uh, for that to find out what the mixing ratio would be at uh, standard pressure. And that corresponds to a mixing ratio of about 15 grams per kilogram. Uh, if you're very moist, uh, the temperature, the dew point temperature and the wet bulb temperature are actually going to be pretty close to one another. Um, so a wet bulb temperature greater than 20 degrees C would be indicative of that. And a wet bulb potential temperature uh, greater than 20 degrees C is also considered a high value. It's very close to the uh, temperature, the wet bulb temperature, because uh, at this point we're talking about the Midwestern U.S. and we're not talking about high elevations. So there's not a big difference between the temperature and the potential temperature. And lastly, we have the equivalent potential temperature greater than 60 degrees C. Uh, and uh, recall that the difference between the potential temperature and the equivalent potential temperature is the amount of latent heat that can be released through the process of condensation. So this high theta E value implies that there is a massive amount of latent heat energy to be released in the air parcel. So here we have the mixed layer lifting condensation level on the x-axis versus a storm category. So category one is a basically a, an air mass thunderstorm, a non-supercell thunderstorm. Um, storm category two, marginal supercell, which is actually what I would classify as a multi-cell thunderstorm. Uh, category three, supercell, no tornado. Category four, supercell with a weak tornado. And category five, a supercell with a significant tornado. And there is a relationship between the height of the lifting condensation level and the strength of the storm, but it's not a super strong relationship. So um, the way that you read this chart is let's start off with a non-supercell thunderstorm at the bottom. So the uh, median of all non-supercell thunderstorms is to have a lifting condensation level of about 1.75 kilometers above the surface. 50% uh, of all non-supercell thunderstorms have a uh, <clears throat> lifting condensation level between about 1.3 kilometers and 2.5 kilometers. We refer to that dark shaded area as the interquartile range. Uh, and then we have uh, outliers that extend uh, beyond that as well. But uh, as you move up into these stronger storms, they tend to have a lower lifting condensation level. So what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, basically you have a smaller difference between the temperature and the dew point temperature, which means that you have a relatively low lifting condensation level. So it means that you're closer to saturation. Uh, that's not a great uh, predictor, in part because how close you are to saturation uh, kind of mirrors the relative humidity, uh, as opposed to being a straight-up dew point temperature correlation. Uh, and you can see that there's quite a bit of overlap uh, between the different types of storms and the mean sea level, uh, or the mean uh, mixed layer lifting condensation level. So here we have a uh, sounding from Norman, Oklahoma from May of 2013. This was a, a tornadic supercell day. And we've already looked at this before to determine the convective available potential energy. So we lifted our air parcel from the surface. We had a relatively low lifting condensation level. Um, and then above that, the blue line is the uh, moist adiabat that the air parcel is following. And once you reach the level of free convection all the way up to the equilibrium level, we integrate that area, and that would be the convective available potential energy. So we've looked at how to uh, determine that graphically, but what we have not done yet is we have not uh, figured out how to determine it uh, mathematically, and that's what we're going to do now. So the convective available potential energy is defined as gravity times the sum, essentially, 
uh, of the buoyancy, the T parcel minus the temperature of the environment divided by the temperature of the environment times delta Z. Uh, if you wanted to do this between pressure surfaces, you can redefine CAPE as R sub D, which is the uh, specific gas constant for dry air, times the sum uh, for each of the layers um, between the difference in the temperature of the parcel minus the temperature in the environment times the natural logarithm of the pressure at the bottom of the layer divided by the pressure at the top. And in order to get accurate results, you basically want to have your delta Z or your delta P uh, be relatively small so that you can integrate over a large number of uh, altitudes in the more uh, layers that you divide the convective available potential energy up into, the more uh, layers you have between the level of pre-convection and the equilibrium level, the more accurate value you'll get for the convective available potential temperature. So is convective available potential energy a good predictor of the storm category? Not really. There's a weak function, a weak relationship between the strength of these uh, thunderstorms and the convective available potential energy. But remember, you need lift, instability, and moisture for thunderstorms to form, and then you need boundaries and shear to get supercell thunderstorms. And the convective available potential energy doesn't have any information about boundaries or shear. Um, it does include information about instability and moisture, but it also doesn't have any information about lift. So you can have very high convective available potential energy, but not have a lifting mechanism and not even get a thunderstorm on a certain day. Uh, or if you happen to have, uh, have a lot of convective inhibition, the sin, then you may not get a super strong uh, storm out of the, uh, the cape as well, because you may not be able to uh, tap into that cape. As was said before, the CAPE value is not a good predictor of whether or not a thunderstorm is actually going to occur, but is a moderately good predictor of the severity of the convection should it occur. If you have very high values of CAPE, say more than 3,500 joules per kilogram, and that's fairly rare, and that would be an extremely unstable case with severe cumulonimbus clouds and tornadoes likely. As you reduce the amount of CAPE available, the atmosphere becomes less unstable and the severity of the cumulonimbus clouds and the possibility of tornadoes goes down. By the time you get to between 0 and 300 uh, joules per kilogram in the Cape, it's a mostly stable situation and little or no thunderstorm activity can be anticipated from that. The updraft velocities can be estimated from the convective available potential energy. So that convective available potential energy is the energy that is released during the condensation process, and that heating of the atmosphere uh, will affect the buoyancy of the air parcels, um, which will cause them to rise. And the maximum amount of vertical velocity that can be achieved is essentially 2 times the value of CAPE with the square root of all of that. However, uh, that assumes that the air parcel undergoes no mixing or no entrainment with the environment. And so that would be kind of in an undiluted core. And that is typically not the case. There's typically dilution that goes on during the updraft. And so what's been determined is that the maximum likely vertical velocity is typically about the uh, W max divided by 2. And this is kind of an uh, uh, observational result rather than a, a purely mathematical one, where W max is actually the theoretical maximum based upon physical processes. The W max likely is uh, based upon observations. So wind shear is one of the important predictors that we use to differentiate between air mass thunderstorm development and multi-cell thunderstorm development. And the wind shear uh, is shown in this particular diagram as the purple arrow. We have wind at uh, three kilometers in the green arrow, wind at four kilometers uh, in the blue arrow, and the 
a shear vector goes between the points of each one of those uh, sort of things. Uh, and we'll use the vector wind difference uh, as a surrogate for the vector wind shear. So we can get the wind shear magnitude uh, by looking at the change in the U component of the uh, individual wind at the two different altitudes. And we can combine that with the change in the V component, which is the north-south wind. So you take delta U squared plus delta V squared, the square root of that, and divide that by the uh, elevation difference between those two. And that will get the shear magnitude. Um, <clears throat> And for wind direction shear, um, I really find it best to use the delta U and delta V components, because once you have those, um, then it's pretty easy to use trigonometry um, to translate the resulting angle, uh, to figure out the resultant angle, and then it takes a little bit of uh, a practice to be able to convert that angle to the meteorological wind rows. And we'll do a whole bunch of examples of that in class. Um, so we can get the wind shear magnitude using the equation, but I just kind of recommend um, thinking through uh, the wind shear direction with the delta U and the delta V components each time. So here's an example of speed shear. Uh, so we have two different kinds of wind shear. We have directional shear and we have speed shear. So here we have uh, wind speeds that are increasing with height. And in this environment, if we had this pinwheel um, that's uh, signified here, um, it would actually spin in a clockwise direction because the top of the pinwheel would be moving faster to the right than the bottom. Uh, and so this vertical wind shear is actually generating this horizontal rotation in the Earth's atmosphere, and we refer to that rotation as vorticity. But right now, we're just focusing in on the concept of speed shear. We also have directional shear. So in this case, the wind speed is the same at all of these different altitudes, yet it happens to be pointing in different directions. And so in this case, the wind direction is changing with height, and that is also a type of wind shear. But generally speaking, in the atmosphere, we have both of these going on at the same time. We have both speed shear and directional shear. And I'll give you an example of that next. So here we have a Ray Winsond skew T diagram for Salem, Oregon from October 12th of 2020. And over on the right, we have the wind speed and direction shown with wind barbs. At the surface, uh, the wind is kind of from the south-southeast at 15 knots, and that gradually changes to the westerly direction. Um, by the time you get up to, say, 70 kilopascals, you're pretty much from the west, and we're basically staying at the west or west-northwest uh, all the way up through the top of the sounding. So if we look at this, we have directional and speed shear, in the lower part of the atmosphere down here. This is really common in the atmospheric boundary layer, and in fact, that's what we have here. Uh, we have the boundary layer extending all the way up to 70 kilopascals on this particular day at this particular location. Um, the wind speed uh, decreases as you get closer to the surface because of increased friction, and that increased friction also changes the force balance uh, on an air parcel, which uh, leads to a change in the direction. So as you move further away from that frictional source, uh, the wind uh, will turn to be what we call geostrophic, which we will define eventually. Um, but that's just a balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. Uh, but in this case, we increased in the boundary layer the wind from 15 knots to 50 knots because uh, actually 60 knots at one point here in the boundary layer, the flag and one full bar is 60 knots. And then above that, we have mostly speed shear. Uh, everything is pretty much from the west and the wind speeds increased all the way up to looks like about 110 knots uh, at about uh, 300, or excuse me, 32.5 kilopascals. Um, 
We've got uh, 110 knot winds from the west northwest. So, is the total shear magnitude a good predictor of thunderstorm severity? Well, not really. Um, recall that you need lift instability and moisture to get uh, non-supercell thunderstorms, basically air mass thunderstorms. You need shear in order to get uh, your multi-cell thunderstorms, but you also need a capping inversion uh, and a dry layer in order to get supercells. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, with no shear uh, versus some shear, there's a difference in the type of uh, thunderstorm that you get. But once you get a supercell formed, um, there's really no difference. Uh, but the, the total shear magnitude really doesn't is not a good predictor of the severity of the supercell thunderstorm. Uh, but you do need to have a total shear magnitude that's higher in order to get these multi-cell thunderstorms and the supercells in the first place. That's the takeaway message from this particular graph. So now we're going to introduce the concept of a hodograph. And in meteorology, hodographs are used to plot the winds from soundings of the Earth's atmosphere. It gives us a visual, graphical representation of the winds and how they change with height. Um, it's a polar diagram where the wind direction is indicated by the angle from the center axis, and the strength of the wind is shown by the distance from the center. So here we have a blank hodograph. So we have the origin at the center, and then we have concentric rings moving out further away from the center, and those are labeled 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Now, you can use whatever units you want on those. You could make those uh, 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second. You could make those 10 knots, 20 knots. It really depends upon the uh, data that you're plotting uh, and the range of the data that you're plotting. And then uh, the azimuth, as we move around, uh, you can actually see uh, changes as well. So uh, down at the bottom center, we have 360 degrees. So if we had a wind from the north, uh, we would actually draw it starting at the origin and moving directly down towards the uh, 360 line. If we had winds directly from the east, that would be a 90 degree wind. It would start from the origin and move to the left to where, to where that 90 degree symbol is at. If we had winds from the south, it would start at the origin and go up on the page all the way up towards the 180. And if we had winds from the west, it would start at the origin and move to the right uh, at, over towards the 270 degree mark. So let's put some actual data onto a hodograph. <clears throat> and typically speaking, the hodographs plot the wind speed and direction uh, in the lowest six kilometers of the atmosphere because that's where the wind shear seems to be the most important for differentiating between air mass thunderstorms and uh, multi-cell thunderstorms. So now we're going to plot up some actual data. So at the surface, we have winds that are at 120 degrees at 5 knots. So let's go ahead and plot that. There we go. Uh, at 1 kilometer above the surface, we had winds that are seven and a half knots from 60 degrees. At two kilometers above the surface, we have winds that are 10 knots uh, from zero degrees or 360 degrees. So this is winds from the north. At three kilometers, uh, the wind speed is 15 knots and it's from a direction of 330 degrees. Four kilometers, the wind is uh, at 310 degrees at about 22 knots. At five kilometers, it's uh, basically at 290 degrees at 30 knots. And at six kilometers, uh, the wind is 280 degrees at 35 knots. So, that's where the data on this hodograph actually comes from. And that's, this is actually how we plot up the hodograph. And the arrows that I drew in in the previous one are implied when you are looking at the hodograph. Um, and you can see that this is a graphical representation of both speed shear 
and directional wind shear as well. So a little bit about supercell thunderstorms. So on the top figure, we basically have a supercell thunderstorm uh, that uh, was forming on the left. And what happens is you end up with a uh, rotating couplets inside the supercell. And this comes from essentially uh, translating horizontal vorticity or rotation into vertical rotation uh, associated with uh, the updraft uh, tilting that vorticity into the vertical. And by having two counter-rotating vortices inside the supercell, what happens is that the storm will typically split into two storms. One will have a core that is rotating clockwise and the other will have a core that is rotating counterclockwise. Uh, in the most common practice or the most common observation is that one of these storms will typically um, die out uh, and uh, the, uh, leaving the other one left to grow. So the top is a situation where both the left moving and the right moving storm um, are persistent. And in the middle one, we have the right moving storm is persistent and the left moving storm was dying out. And uh, in the bottom one uh, on C, we have the left moving storm that is persistent and the right moving storm that is dying out. And one of the things that we can do to predict whether or not we will have a symmetric situation, a right moving storm or a left moving storm is actually the wind shear in the environment. It plays a key role in determining the evolution of the supercell thunderstorm once it forms. So here we have a uh, hodograph that is as commonly associated with uh, symmetrical growth with basically persistence of the uh, left and right moving cells along the way, a straight line on the hodograph. Uh, we do have a wind shear here uh, and uh, it's just set up in such a way that uh, we end up with a symmetrical storm out of it. So here we have a uh, observational you know, hodograph that is commonly associated with right moving supercells. Uh, so we have uh, wind that is essentially changing from uh, easterly, uh, at the surface to a westerly aloft uh, and getting stronger, of course. And then here we have an example of something that is favoring a left moving supercell. Uh, 